What's up, everybody? Charlie Marlowe here, Brendan Schaefer, brand new podcast. We don't even have a name for it. So if you have a name, reply in the comments with the name. We'll get to that. That's not that important because on YouTube, we got to hit the hole. I will say first, though, Brendan, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing great, man. Just uh, making our way through the Cardinal offseason here. Looking forward to winter warm-up coming up this weekend. Uh, I hate the weather right now, but spring is around the corner. I believe it in my soul. So we'll be we'll be all right here in a few weeks. I do have a credential for winter warm up. I'm not gonna sure I'm it? gonna go, <laughs> but I might. Sounds I right. might go. I might go. All right. Let's start off like this big picture. I'll ask you first and then I'll I'll give you my answer. This is an easy one. Okay. Or maybe not. Just give me give me your grade, letter grade. You can do pluses and minuses also for the Cardinals off season so far. What's their letter grade? Man, and I guess part of that is, do you assume they could do a little bit more? Do they have room to do a little bit more? I feel like it's a passing grade, certainly, but I'm not necessarily going to give it super high marks. I'm I'm leaning toward like B minus right now, and I don't know if that's like the, the fun part about this is, I don't know if saying that Cardinals fans will go, oh my gosh, what a homer, or oh, give them some credit. Like, I truly have no idea what the reaction to that would be, but I we do. Knew the need Okay, well, we knew the needs going in. I'll, I'll, I'll explain my rationale and then let you go. We knew the needs were like three starting pitchers. And then when Moselock kind of dialed that back to, well, maybe two and a half, it was like, okay, how how much are they actually going to do? They got their three. They got them in a very cardinals -y way. And so I don't think that's exciting for people. I think they built a foundation, a floor, didn't really chase ceiling with those additions. Uh, but they made those moves. I think it had to happen. And Sonny Gray is a, is a good kind of top half of the rotation guy. So that's something. And then I do think the, the move that was announced this week with Hein Bloom was a, was a solid move as well that I'm going to give him a little bit of credit for because of his track record with pitcher development in, in Tampa. And then, you know, Boston's farm system, say what you will about their big league team when he was there, their farm system has made their way toward the top of the rankings as well. So I'll give him some credit for that and go B minus for the time being. So I'm going to ask you about Heim Bloom in a second here, but uh, the reason I interjected is a lot of people have been commenting on my YouTube, and we'll tell people to obviously subscribe to yours as well at the end. Of course, the after they watch, yours is the good watch, one. Mine's the peasant one. That's good. I that's no, fine. Just watch my videos first, then right. Brendan. You can no, go to but mine it's now. funny. You ever? I do this all the time. I, I argue with myself, right? I argue yeah. with myself. So it's important for me to put this out there because I have many times before the season, the off season started, I said the Cardinals, in my opinion, needed to get two starting pitchers that were better than miles. Michaelis. That's okay. what I said before the winter. Well, they haven't done that in my opinion. So when I did one of these for myself and I said, I think the Cardinals, I think I said B or B minus. I can't remember. It was definitely a B. A lot of people like no one agreed with me. Okay. okay. Some people did, but then I started to argue with myself and I said, Okay, this is like Austin Powers. Allow myself to introduce myself. But if I said before the winter, the Cardinals have to get two pitchers better than Miles Michaelis, and I feel they haven't achieved that, how can I give them a good grade? Which I think is a fair thing to say. So whether it's B, B minus, C plus, I think that's I think that's fair, but I also think it might be good enough for the Cardinals to get into the playoffs with what they have. But what I didn't like was I just all along I thought this Cardinals were going to sign Sonny Gray. I think everybody thought that not yeah. just a Sonny Gray pitcher, literally a Sonny Gray. Gray. Yeah. Okay. They were going to sign somebody from what I called the Michael Waka bucket. It didn't end up being Michael Waka, but I put Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn in that bucket. The other one was the trade for the whoever you wanted, the Ceases of the world, the Logan yeah. Gilberts, even an Alec Manoa, whoever. A high end or high upside trade piece. So I think they did the Sonny Gray. They've skipped the trade piece. They grabbed two people from the Michael Walker bucket, and it wasn't Michael Walker. But still, so I can't, I can't hate on them because I think when Moselock said three pitchers, then he dialed it back. Then I'm thinking, are they even going to get three? Well, they got three. I think most people like two of them. They have nothing against really either Lynn or Gibson. It's more the fact that it's two of those type of guys. Yeah, two of those guys that you feel like you're establishing the floor for your rotation instead of chasing ceiling. Although, like, you could make the argument with Lance Lynn. Last year's Chicago White Sox were a lot like the Cardinals, just didn't go the way they thought it would. They had more talent than probably the record indicated. And I wonder if it was a very good environment to, to play successfully. 
and you know Lance Lynn, you know how he is. It might have just been, you know what, I just got to stay in my lane and strike out a bunch of dudes and give up a bunch of home runs and, and just let the chips fall where they may. In a better environment, which hopefully this year's Cardinals clubhouse is, could Lance Lynn return to being kind of what he had been before last year? I think there's a chance of that. Now, is that better than Miles Michaelis? It depends on if Miles Michaelis returns to being better than he was last year. So, like, there's there you could make the argument in favor of the Cardinals if you wanted to, but I think for a lot of Cardinals fans, it's like, all right, this team just won 71 games. Do we really need to strain ourselves to make the argument in favor of them, or is the burden on the Cardinals to make the moves that are so clearly and obviously a winner in the offseason that you can then kind of have the fans reinvest? I, I feel like that's part of the attitude as well with people that would say B minus you're, you know, you're being, uh, you're being too generous. <laughs> okay. You mentioned the 71 wins. I've had some people, this is where I do my own straw man argument where I'm arguing against the people that have made comments over the last several months. But I, I think you a lot of the comments... these things though, because when you're in, when you're doing a podcast by yourself, that's why I'm so glad that we're linking up to do this once a week. When you're doing it by yourself, you have to sort of have multiple personalities or it gets kind of stale after a while. So I, I get it when you say these things, but also, and I joke, because some of the comments are crazy, but a lot of them are really smart. There's a lot of smart Cardinal baseball fans. You know that, that like to jump no in and, and talk. So here's here's another one of my ta takes that I actually think is pretty positive for the Cardinals because I don't think the Cardinals were really a 71-win team last year. And what I mean by that is more so, I think, if you said, oh, the Cardinals are going to jump from 70 wins to 90, that feels like a huge jump. Right. I think there's a good chance they do that because – Look, last year started terrible. At the deadline, they sold away. So whatever they were, a, a 10 games below 500 team, they brought up a 4A roster. They became a 20 games below, which is fine because to me, once you tank, you should tank. You shouldn't go even try. It. I'm glad yeah. they did that. But my point is more so, if a couple things go better early, the Cardinals aren't really that bad. And here's another thing. Look, we all love Wayno and his concerts and all that. I think sometimes we forget how bad Wayno. Wayno was literally one of the worst pitchers in the history of baseball for how many starts he got. All yep. you need is all you need is somebody to be league average in his spot, and that's a huge improvement. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the Cardinals jumping from 70 wins to 90 is something that could totally happen with relative ease this year. And I, I agree with pretty much everything that you said. And I've echoed some of those sentiments on my on my channel as well. Like when you think about April, they go 10 and 19. And there was it seemed like as it became clear that last year was a bust, everybody was starting to kind of figure out why. And when any topic of the World Baseball Classic would come up, Cardinals fans would freak out like they're just making excuses. But I think there might be something to the fact that when you have so many changes on the coaching staff, and the catcher in particular, because that was a hot button issue at the time as well. Contreras said, hey, I want to be in spring training, not going to do the WBC. A lot of the pitchers didn't say that. And then lo and behold, a month into the season, you're benching your catcher because there's something, you know, there's just enough going on that everybody's not on the same page. I would make the case that if the Cardinals didn't go 10 and 19 in April, if it's, you know, 13 and 16 even or 14 and 15, you're a little bit closer to striking distance. They might not have felt compelled to press the panic button on the Contreras thing in the way that they did, which Moselock back in December in Nashville at the winter meetings said, yeah, we were naive in thinking the catcher situation from Yachty to a new catcher could go smoothly. And we wish we had handled that not so publicly in the way that we benched Contreras. And I think they could have kept it in house if it would have been a little bit better in April and the snowball doesn't roll down the hill the way that it did. I think that had an impact to where when you're chasing behind the eight ball the rest of the year, and then you get to the trade deadline and it's over. And then somebody gets a hangnail in August or September and they're on the IL to end the season. Like it just didn't matter at that point. You don't run Wainwright out the, the way that you did if you actually had a chance to come back. So like all of those elements, I do think took a, maybe it was an 80 win roster, but it took that down to 71 by the end of the year. That's I'm in a hundred percent agreement. That's why the jump to me to 90 is more like a 10. It's like a 10 win jump. It's not a 20 win jump. Um, the Contreras thing still, as much as we talked about it, it's almost like we don't talk about it enough. That was just one of the weirdest things I've ever seen of, of, a, of a dude who's caught for seven or eight years who they say, hey, you can't you can't even catch. It's it's nutty. So, OK, Hein Bloom, the news this week. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I'll start with you, though. Give me give me your thoughts on Hein Bloom as an advisor. I'm a big fan of it. 
No, I guess I'll add more than that, uh, since that's what you said. I think it's good because when you think about what Cardinals fans have longed for, like we both hear a lot of the same comments from the fan base, and it's like, man, those Tampa Bay Rays, why can't the Cardinals be like the Rays? They always develop pitchers. They make the right trades. Their their evaluation of talent seems to be on point. Like, why can't the Cardinals do those things? And you're taking one of the architects of that era of the Rays and adding him to your staff. Like, if you want it to just be a simpler boilerplate sentence, I think that would be the way that you would describe it. And from that perspective, Cardinal fans, I would have to think, would be on board with it. And the guy knows his pitching. And even, like, not just the obvious, oh, get the top prospects and and draft well and all these things, but I think the evaluation of the trades the Rays have made over the years it's really interesting that when you look at already at this Cardinals offseason, the number of guys that Heim Bloom has had familiarity with from a pitcher perspective, not star guys, but kind of in that next tier as the Cardinals look to build their bullpen. I wonder if they see the benefits of that right away because there's already a handful of guys, Kittredge from Tampa, the Boston guys, and even Riley O'Brien. That was a Mariners trade, but he was drafted by the Rays when Bloom was there. So that's stuff that I imagine he was advising on or, or green lighting whether he was like spearheading or just saying, yeah, these are good guys to go after it. I don't know if it makes a difference. I think his impact could be felt right away. And all in all, I think it's a positive move to add. him. I a hundred percent agree. We got, we got to, we got to debate more. I have to disagree with you, but yeah, we have to come up with some, some discord. We here. will, we will. I'm sure. No, I think it's interesting. Like Kit Ridge is a proven commodity, but as you mentioned, Bloom has either seen or had his hands on all these guys from these, these moves, which I think is not a coincidence. But the one for me is Nick Robertson. Like, I brought this up on the radio. I don't know anything about Nick Robertson. I'm not going to pretend like I did. Right. But I didn't know anything about Giovanni Gallegos when they made that move for Luke Voigt. And we were all talking about Tra- Chase and Shreve, who ended up being nothing. And Giovanni Gallegos has been one of the Cardinals' best two or three relievers for four or five years. So I think Heim Bloom, the fact that he did – what he did with the Rays, the Cardinals and the Rays have the same blueprint, which to me is probably part of the reason that Heim Bloom didn't work with the Red Sox. They always want yeah. the big move, but they rip him for Mookie Betts. They had competitive, competitive balance tax issues, but the Cardinals don't really want to make the big move. So like Boston fans who are pissed at Bloom for not making the big move, well, in the Cardinals front office, they're like, hey, you're our same brain, with, but we have two to three times the payroll as the race. So I think it's a much better fit with the Cardinals. And then I'll advance the story here because, you know, I'll put my tinfoil hat on, but this is what I first thought about. I'm just thinking, okay, let's be honest. John Mosellock has what we think is two years left. Yep. It seemed like he rolled out the, not the succession plan, but the plan that he's going to step away at that spring training last year, whenever that was. So you got Gersh, you got Randy Flores. Well, the Cardinals like in-house guys. Well, now Heim Bloom's in-house. And let's be real. The, the competitive advantage the Cardinals had that built those amazing teams from 11 to 15, that competitive analytic advantage is gone. And maybe everybody knows that. I'm not saying they're terrible. They just don't have like that big-time advantage. And so maybe if Mosellock steps away in two years, maybe this is the time where it makes sense to go outside of the organization, even though it's a guy who could still – theoretically be here so the conspiracy theorist in me i also wonder about two years from now if you have gersh and you have flores they like them both flores has been great with the draft but man if you got a guy sitting in your organization as an advisor who's been the man with the rays and the red sox it's also hard to pass that dude up if he's still there and he hasn't taken their job and if he wants that again right because part of the story of heim bloom after the red sox fired him was like he's ready to step back for a little while not trying to jump right into another pobo job which is perfect for this, right? He's part-time. Mm-hmm. He's not even relocating to St. Louis at this point. And so you you get your feet wet a little bit for a couple of years. You learn the ins and outs of the organization. And then somebody with that pedigree, could he decide in two years that he'd like to step back into that role and take the reins of an organization? I think it's conceivable. And you think about the way that Bill DeWitt likes to operate. This ownership group and John Mozeliak, like it was a big deal when they replaced Walt Jockety. Right. And that that's been 15, 20 years ago at this point. And we haven't seen that kind of big move since then. And so they like that continuity. And so when John Mozeliak says, yeah, you know, I, I think this will probably be my last contract as the head guy running the Cardinals to, to find the next guy and to be able to kind of 
have someone that you think is quality, which I think Heim Bloom is, and that's not to denigrate the guys they've got in-house, but doesn't it feel like the Cardinals could benefit from a little bit of a, a change of perspective with the way things have gone over the last few years? So I think for me right now, and this is just speculative, if I if you had to place the betting odds, he'd be my favorite over the the others that are in-house to take over in a couple of years. And I think it'll come down to his influence being positive for two years. And then does he want that step up in responsibility when the time comes? If those two things happen, I think he'd be favored over Flores, over Gersh at this moment in time. Okay, so I asked you earlier about the grade, but that was an off-season grade. How do you flip that into how good you think the Cardinals will actually be? And if you want to throw a win total, you can. You don't have to. And I, you know, I'm asking you this question, but and I was going to ask you it in the scope of the division, but like the Cubs haven't done anything yet, you know. So I mean, oh, Shota Imanaga, hello. Okay, I mean, that's big time. So that was just yesterday. But I'm, I'm. You can take this however way you want it. Just. How good do you think the Cardinals will be or a win total or within the division, which it seems like, I mean, the Brewers, what the hell are they going to do? I mean, I, I don't know. The Reds, I guess they could be good. What do you think? I think the division is there. And I wonder if part of the Cardinals strategy, because I don't think they have gotten to a level above the, the like the payroll expectation that they sort of set in the beginning of the off season when they said, oh, we could go to this level. I, I don't know all the numbers offhand. Some of the people that do are, you know, they, they get really into the nitty gritty and I'm like, yeah, well, whatever. But I think, I, I think there would be more room, but then you see Bill DeWitt the third saying recently, well, we no no big moves probably as, as it pertains to payroll moving forward. So that kind of makes you wonder exactly what their thinking is. If it's eh, the division hasn't done much. So maybe we're kind of good where we are. I, I, I was asked this question on a podcast within the last week, but in the context of when I do those polls at the beginning of the season on Twitter, the win total. And I want to know what Cardinals fans think. I wasn't asked, what do you think the win total is? I was asked, where would you put the poll that you think Cardinals fans would, would be about a 50, 50 split. And I think I landed on like 86 and a half as of right now feels like about the number. And that's an interesting spot because it could be enough to win the division, depending on what happens with some of those other teams, but it's not going to satisfy Cardinals fans. If you sneak in with 86 wins and then it's a, it's another kind of 2021 first round elimination in, in a best two out of three. But I think that's kind of about where they are right now, at least it, with what you could expect them to do, because they've risen. The floor is better. Like you're not going to run out Adam Wainwright. You're not going to run out Dakota Hudson or Jake Woodford or Drew Rom for these starts, barring a lot of injuries. And so that's going to help by itself. They haven't done a lot in the bullpen. I, you'd think that like one more really key arm could be that, that guy to make you feel like, okay, get through six innings with these starters and then lock it down with the pen. Kittredge maybe will be that, but coming off of an injury, you're not 100% sure. Um, offensively, I'm still intrigued to see what, like kind of how they align the the offense and the defense and, and get the guys in there that need to be in there every day. I don't know. Like I feel like they're mid-80s right now, and, and it could certainly be worse because things went wrong last year. There's nothing to say that things won't go wrong again this year, but if you wanted to be optimistic and say things could go right in a way that they didn't in 23, and yeah, like mid to upper 80s seems possible, but would I guarantee that? Like, I don't feel comfortable with that at this point, but it's possible that they're, are they favored to win the division? There's a lot of teams that could do it. It's kind of wide open right now. This is uh, what I find funny is, and maybe I'm too realistic because sometimes when I'm thinking about the Cardinals, you know how this goes. You've covered the Cardinals a long time. I've been here 16 years. I've stopped really wishing because I know, and I'm not, I'm not some genius, but you know how the Cardinals do business, right? Yeah. So like when they're done, they're probably done. You almost know what they're going to do before they do it. So that decreases my expectations immediately. I understand why the fans want more, but we kind of know what the Cardinals are going to do. The reason I bring this up is I find this funny because last winter, and you're on radio, I'm on radio. All we talked about was the Cardinals need to go beyond the 90 win or whatever, 88 wins, maybe win the Central, maybe get a wild card, first round exit. Fans were pissed about that. That's where the Cardinals were. Let's be real. I'm bad with math, but what? 20, 21, 22. They were 88 to 91, whatever the hell. Maybe you win the Central, maybe you get a wild card. Nobody thinks you're elite. Nobody thinks you're really a World Series contender. You get broomed quick in the playoffs. We were complaining about that. We said we wanted more. 
2023 was so bad, we've now dialed it back to hoping we can get back to the 90 wins that we complained about last winter. That's a great way to take some pressure off yourself if you're the Cardinals. Just have a terrible year so that we're all sort of manipulated into thinking that the previous status quo, which everybody hated, is now the goal. Like, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's very Cardinals. The whole thing is very Cardinals. And you mentioned, like, knowing the moves are going to make before they make them. We we all had the Sonny Gray thing pegged way in advance. And I think that probably kind of grates on Mo that it's so predictable what they do because then when they do the thing, it's not that anybody's really excited about it. They're like, okay, that the thing that we knew, you can check that off the list. Now what? And he's like, what do you mean now what? We just did the big thing. That was it. That was the big thing. It happened last year with Contreras. Like you could look at it and go, well, the Cardinals could get bold here. They could get creative. They could trade for a catcher or they could just say, well, we need a catcher. Who's going to, who's the biggest name out there that we could get. Let's have a meeting with him. And if we like him, maybe we'll just sign him and, oh, we can relax because we we did the thing we set out to do. I think it's just like that very A to B mindset that the Cardinals have to as quickly as possible fix their issues so that the bottom doesn't drop out of their, their season and they lose a lot of ticket sales and, and, and fan support. Well, they did that thing with the catcher and they didn't do anything else. And one thing led to another and the bottom dropped out of their season. So this year they really had to get out in front of it and be like, we got to be correct about what's going to at least get us to that 82 win mark so that we can at least kind of keep fan interest intact. And before Thanksgiving, they had their whole off season finished. Like that is such a good description that you gave of, we kind of know before they're going to do it, what they're going to do. And one way or another, it, it there's a way for fans to be disappointed at the end of it. They'll be happy if somehow the, the win total exceeds expectations. But after a season like they just had, I think people wanted something, something flashy in the off season. And I don't know if they really got it. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Sonny Gray. You like to gamble. I like to gamble. I, I think I would have put my entire family's life savings <laughs> that the Cardinals would have signed Sonny Gray. No one has ever more felt like a Cardinal yep. from who he is, his age, and his price point ever. And this is not just me and you. Everyone said that. Like, Sonny Gray is a Cardinal. He just is. Everything about him screams St. Louis Cardinal. Okay, so here's another kind of topic based off that. And this this gets me back to last year also. When we all say the Cardinals are going to make the playoffs, which I, I thought they were the last several years, and I still probably think they will this year. But I think it's important to note that, at least me, I'll speak for myself. I think when I say the Cardinals are going to make the playoffs these last several years when they've had pitching issues, I mean, this year you have pitchers, they're all 35 to 36, whatever, 34 years old. My mindset is more of, I think the Cardinals from an organizational standpoint are going to be good enough as they were in what 21 and 22 to be around 500 at the break, add the pitching, whether it's Lester and Hap or Montgomery and Quintana to then get to the 88 to 90 wins. And I think it's important to note that because a lot of people, me included, said that last year, nobody said the Cardinals were this. Everybody knew the starting pitching was terrible. I mean, did you read one projection? Nothing. No one said. Maybe maybe mid-pack. I mean, maybe somebody said the Cardinals rotation was 13th, but I saw 18th, 27th, 26th, whatever. I think everybody thought they were going to have to add. So in saying that I think the Cardinals are good and going to make the playoffs, I still feel like they'll probably be around 500, maybe a little above. Come on, some of these, one of these pitchers, they're all 35. One of these guys is going to get hurt. They're probably going to have to add, but I think most teams add a starter and a reliever at the deadline to get to the playoffs. So I think the Cardinals are in a similar spot as they were the last three, four years. But last year, just everything went to shit. You know, we thought, though, like there was an angle of last year. And the, my favorite word to use is one that Mosellock has used before, because I think it describes their mindset is when he says, well, that would be complicated. Last year, people wanted the Cardinals to add more pitching. But when you went down the list at who they already had, they were paying six guys. Like mm -hmm. Dakota Hudson was number six and he was making, yeah. you know, a few million dollars, you know, and, and what are you going to do at that point? You got to get a free agent and say, well, we've got these guys that you're going to compete with to be our number four or our number five like that. I understand where Mo was coming from, from that perspective when he talked about it prior to 2023 saying it, those pitchers in the free agent market didn't really find our situation to be intriguing to them. And I would understand why that is. There is this thing in Major League Baseball called a trade that you can do, and <laughs> you can force a pitcher against his will to come to your team. 
And it, a lot of times, like the Cardinals, this offseason, what did Mo say? Well, all these guys wanted to be Cardinals, so he signed them. Like, that's a good thing. That's a noble thing to want to have. But, like, when you need a certain thing that doesn't exist in the free agent market or it's going to cost you more than you want to pay for it, occasionally you do have to send talent to get those players. And I, that's what's tricky about this offseason because we saw their approach last year, which was to not make any of those trades, to clear up some of the roster glut and to get some things that they needed that they didn't have. And so coming into this offseason, it was like, well, surely they recognize that maybe you do sometimes have to make an uncomfortable trade to get what you don't have. And there are options out there. Like if you if you go pay up for a Dylan Cease, it can be done. Maybe he doesn't end up getting traded. And so Mo's defense will be, well, he didn't get traded. So that tells you what their asking price was. I get that. But at a certain point, there are guys that have moved. You know, I was I thought Tyler Glass now would be a nice fit. Now the Dodgers gave up a nice young pitcher to get him from the Rays. So there are there are reasons that the Cardinals don't make some of these moves. But if you were serious about, hey, 2024 is the year that we're really going to have to fix things and, and reinstill uh, some faith from the fan base, I feel like something like that that gives you some upside within your rotation. Even Manoa, like you said, could be a bust. Could, maybe he's broken. But there, there, it seemed there would be room. So you mentioned roster glut. And we've talked mostly about pitching so far. But I'm intrigued to get your opinion on the on the roster glut and the outfield. So they obviously trade Palacios. They trade Tyler O'Neill. I think we all knew they had to get rid of some outfielders. I am a Tommy Edmond at second base guy. I just think the Cardinals are better overall defensively. I just love having a gold glove second baseman. I understand he can play center field, um, but I think that's also more about who else they have in center field. So the fact that the Cardinals said Tommy Edmond is going to start the year as as an outfielder, Okay, so now you got, let's just say, Edmund in center, Walker in right, Newt Barr to start in left. I mean, Dylan Carlson, I feel like this is his absolute last year to prove anything. Does he even have any trade value? Uh, if he doesn't play well this year, he has none whatsoever. So I don't know. Like, I I, I kind of argue with myself again about Tyler O'Neill. They kind of ruined that relationship. So I, I understand why he had to go at this point but that's their own fault like they ruined that relationship and and it's his fault too but I don't know like I can see how a fan would think well you got rid of O'Neal he only had one year left with a big prove it if he's healthy he's going to be good Palacios brings energy he has six years we liked that and you kept Carlson right you kept Carlson I don't know I understand why fans kind of bitch about that I I do as well And I understand it too. And you can look at like their past actions and that ends up being the type of thing they do over and over again. There's a guy that conceivably would be at the height of his trade value and you go, well, we're, he's a building block. Why, you know, we can't possibly trade him. And then he kind of loses that luster and you go, this is kind of a line in the sand moment where you could trade him. You could cut your losses and say, yeah, there was a point where he was worth more, but he's not now. And we got to live in that reality. Or you can hold on until you basically don't get much at all for the guy. Last year, that was the Tyler O'Neill year, I feel like, where they said, hey, we're going to give you every chance to be a main guy for us. And it didn't work out. And so they cut their losses and at this point didn't care what they got for him. I think Dylan Carlson is one year away from that unless he should regain some value and, and, and find himself. The issue for him is two injuries. Like he hasn't been able to stay healthy in the same way that O'Neill. It's just various maladies that that should strike him and and. You don't want to label a guy, but I think O'Neill certainly has the injury-prone label at this point. Can Carlson have a healthy year to kind of get rid of that stigma for himself? It's interesting, though, that you mentioned Edmund at second base. I agree that I think if he played second base and you didn't move him around, he he's obviously been a gold glover there. Last year, his numbers at second were terrible. I continue to say that it's because you tell a guy he's going to be the everyday shortstop, and then when DeYoung comes back, well, he can't possibly move off a shortstop. He doesn't have the mentality for it. So, Tommy, it's you. And then he's, you know, being being kind of jostled around a bunch until he finds himself in center field defensively. But, like, if Tommy's your second baseman, I want to explore this. What do you do with Donovan Gorman? Like, how do you let that play out? Is the answer a trade? Because if so, I could totally see that. I think you'd need a good outfielder that you can trust in center if you went that route. But I'm also kind of wondering if there is no trade, does putting Tommy at second just it doesn't fit with the roster is kind of what I'm is is what I'm thinking. But I'm curious for your thought on that. Yeah. And when I said that, I mean, like in the Charlie Utopia. Yeah. If everything was perfect, if you had a center fielder that you liked and a whatever, a shortstop, 
I just like him better at second. But you bring up a good point. And here's something we, we're not talking about Mason Wynn. I think we're all assuming he he's going to be. No, no. I love Mason Wynn. But we're all assuming he's going to be your 140-game shortstop as a rookie. So I hope he's good. But what if he doesn't hit? That's another part of this. When you asked me that, the first thing I thought of was, it gets back to the way we started this, where I thought the Cardinals were going to make a significant trade. When I say significant trade for a starting pitcher, I mean not trading Tyler O'Neill, not trading Richie Palacios. I thought a Gorman or a Donovan or an Edmund. So yeah. someone who is good, has value, especially Gorman or, or Donovan. And that would also relieve some of the questions we're asking right now about where does every piece fit? So I still think, even though they got rid of two outfielders, if Edmund is an outfielder, okay, so Gorman and Donovan split up second base. I don't know. I mean, Carlson will probably never play, which – because Donovan can play outfield. Let's be honest. Play, don't you left. Yeah, I don't you want Donovan – I mean, don't – give me the give me the opportunity that you want Carlson to play ever over, over Newt. Or I understand there's going to be rest days and all that, right? But, I mean, you're going to have to make the choice of, okay, then, like, Gorman sits on this day or Donovan sits on this day. You got the DH. But, like, most days I'm going to say I want Carlson to sit. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because if they're describing Carlson as the backup to Edmund and center, they're kind of the same guy. They both switch hit, and you both don't – you don't want both against right-handed pitching. Like, it's not a platoon. If if Carlson was a switch hitter who was stronger against right-handed pitching or vice versa with Edmund, then you could say perfect, they match each other. But they're the same, they're redundant. Even in center field, they're redundant. They can both play the position defensively, but it's not like a good platoon match, which is again an example of the roster not fitting together super well. But I agree with you. Like Donovan, I, I could paint it to where Donovan plays some left field uh on days that Walker DHs, because if he in, doesn't end up being the outfielder they wanted to be. This will be the year where they have to kind of put him at DH a little bit more often and then think about a succession plan to where eventually he plays first base more as Goldie declines or whatever they do. Like, that's part of it. I agree with you. Like, Carlson has the, is like the, the break glass center fielder right now if Edmund is your starting center fielder. That, I, I think that's a fair way to put it. And this is why I've always, I've always said this with baseball. If you just have a center fielder that you can plug in and a shortstop that you can plug in, everything falls into place. I know Harrison Bader was hurt, but when he was your center fielder, everything else made sense right there. The last couple of years when DeYoung wasn't really hitting at all or in the minors and Edmund, like, okay, he's fine at short, but you don't love it. I just feel like that's why Mason Wynn is so is so key. If Mason Wynn is your, if he's your shortstop for the next seven years, boom. I mean, that is so big. To have a guy like that who can be an offensive plus potentially at shortstop as well. So, okay. How about how about Ali and Ali's future? I like the fact, because I think sometimes the Cardinals give deals and extensions either too quickly or they give them in a player sense. They give them at the end when they don't deserve it. You know, it's the legacy Cardinal, the Matt Carpenter extension. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to say they're doing that with Goldie because Goldie's still very productive, but Look, you're going to give Goldie that last extension where other teams that are just straight up business money might not do it. Okay, Goldie's probably going to be fine, but that could look bad if he really ages. But my question is more, so Ali, I think it makes sense. Ali right now, in my opinion, does not deserve a contract extension. Although, I understand why he doesn't necessarily deserve to be fired. Now, I think he could have been fired last year. I'm not saying he 100% should have been. But I think it makes sense that this is his prove it after a good 2022, an awful 2023. Ollie, prove it and you'll get your extension. And I think that's fair. What do you think? And I agree with you. My argument against firing him was always, are you going to trust the guy that that made the manager change in the first place to hire the right guy next? Like, at what point does it fall on Mosellock in the front office and the, the process they were going through? to arrive at, at this manager in the first place. If the viewpoint was, well, he's the problem. Well, who hired him? I don't think Ollie was the problem last year. I know Cardinals fans hate hearing that. I think if I wanted to, I could spend three hours diving into all the reasons, but that podcast would get very bad reviews because people would just say, oh, you're caping for the Cardinals. You're making excuses. 
Uh, I, I think a lot of it was reality, but I, I think you can't possibly extend Ollie before this season, right? That's why they didn't, because the optics of that would be would be pitiful. And it is kind of that that mode of yeah, like Bill DeWitt doesn't want to ever fire Mo, but if this year goes bad, does Mo step into the Joe McEwing role the next year and somebody else takes the reins, right? Even though he's still under contract, it's like he's now an advisor to something and he's going to take a step back. Like I could envision that world where if if ticket sales start to decline of, of a second 70 win season, could the Cardinals have to do something they don't want to do? Yeah, and in that world, everybody probably kind of gets reorganized. The the field manager is is part of that and nobody really bats an eye because of course at that point you just have to recognize where you're at. I, I think Ollie is a good manager. I think he's a sharp manager. People will ask, well, who's better, Ollie or Schilt? And I'm like, I mean, I think both of them are solid guys. I think both are better than Matheny was. Uh, and and that doesn't really track with a lot of people because they'll look at the win-loss record and say, well, that's that's impossible. You can just look at Matheny. He had a lot of success. Like, why would you give Ollie more credit than him? It's hard to say if you're not in the office, but, you know, it. it I, I, I've seen enough from Ollie to believe that he's got a handle on the way these things need to go. I think he learned about himself last year. Like, there's a stubborn streak to Ollie Marmel that I think if there's adversity this year, he'll treat some things differently, but he still has to be the manager that he believes he is when he goes into these situations. And that's unyielding in a lot of things. Um, you know, the Tyler O'Neill thing at the beginning of the year last year was an example. You could say, well, Ollie threw him under the bus and that was the problem. Maybe, but like by the end of the season, I wasn't sitting in a spot where I was looking to defend Tyler O'Neill as this martyr of the 2023 Cardinals. Like, no, I think Ollie was, was seeing something early on in that team that he didn't like. And he was desperate without showing out or desperation to try to put a stop to it and ultimately failed last year, but could it just have been the roster? Like there's a lot of problems with last year's team. I think for, for what they believed Ollie could be for, for a long time to come in St. Louis, it makes sense to hitch his wagon to this 2024 season being better. And if it is, then he'll be extended and you can, you can go on. If it's not, there's a name that a lot of Cardinals fans are going to want to bring up in terms of who could replace him. Okay, I'll get to that in one second. That was going to be my next question. We're we're on the same page right here. I will say with with Ollie though, and again, I didn't say Ollie should be fired, but if he was, I mean, it wouldn't have surprised me. The only way it would have surprised me last year is because the Cardinals don't do that. The Cardinals don't do rash things that like the big market teams do, right? Like fire a guy that quick. But I do think you can make the case that last year, first of all, just so everybody knows, I think the reason the Cardinals were bad last year was the pitching staff was terrible, awful, terrible. Now, did Ollie take some pitchers out probably too early? I think that's part of it. But also the pitching staff was just horrendous. That's more on Mosaic in the front office than Ollie. But I do think the baseball got sloppy. And I understand that Jordan Walker's trying a new position and all that. But we never saw the crispness of the baseball fall off. Until you go back to the Matheny era at the end, which is why he was fired. That was why the Cardinal way and George Kissel, it was sloppy and base running and defense. And Schilte yeah. cleaned that up. And last year, I feel like the Cardinals, they weren't a crisp baseball team. Defensively, not great. Base running, not great. So not just Ollie, but coaching staff overall. We used to say, oh, the Cardinals had a coaching staff advantage back in the day. We used to talk about not just Dave Duncan, but Jose Okendo with infielders. You got Willie McGee. I don't know. I just I watched the baseball last year. The pitching sucked. Don't get me wrong, but also the baseball didn't remind me of Cardinal baseball. Now maybe that's because they were so bad. Wayno's given up an eight ERA, and maybe just the season was always destined to suck. I don't know, but I also think the coaching staff is responsible for some of those things I mentioned, which is the base running, the defense, the crispness of the baseball. They changed a lot at once. Some of it they chose to do. Other parts of it they had. It was hoisted upon them and they had to make the most of it. And I think that had a cumulative effect. You mentioned the coaching staff, like whether you thought Mike Maddox was a great pitching coach or not is irrelevant. He did win the world series this year with his new team, but he had a lot of like institutional wisdom and knowledge that I feel like the Cardinals missed last year, which isn't to say that like Dusty Blake can't be a good coach, but the drop off was inevitable in retrospect, right? we painted the picture of, well, he's an analytics guy and that's going to be good because it's going to help them move forward. But in reality, there are some things that they missed out on because of that move. Um, the, the hitting coach situation happened to them. Jeff Albert also said, eh, I want to move on. Whether you loved him or you hated him, that was part of it. 
And so they they promote from within there as well and say, you know, we're going to Turner Ward's going to get the job done. The bench coach thing, I think, had an impact. Joe McEwing's not the bench coach this coming year. What does that tell you about, you know, the, the way that that situation played out? They had a handpicked guy and then he was like, oh, never mind. I don't want to do that because I don't need to do that. Like, you know, it was like whatever you make of Holiday's decision, that was something that they were like, OK, who's been a bench coach in Major League Baseball before? Because spring training is in three weeks. You land on Joe McEwing, and I don't think it, it's not to say he's a bad coach, but I don't know if it was a great fit for the Cardinals. And that's before you even get to the, the catcher switch that they knew was coming for years. So maybe they could have done a little bit more prior planning. And it's so interesting that for years you talk about how invaluable Yadier Molina is. And then when you have to move on from him, you go, well, we didn't know it was going to be that big of a change. Well, which is it? Like, was it empty words before about the praise for him? Or was it, yeah, we, you know, we, he was important and, and we really should have been a little bit more on top of that. I think it was all of it. I think it was complacency that you could change all of these things at once and have it not be as big of a problem as it was, which could be a little concerning given that this year, don't, don't the moves feel a little bit cardinalsy? Didn't you want something to feel different than the complacency of before? I think is definitely a fair question, but you're right. The coaching staff void, I think was a factor. I think Daniel Descalzo, they got their bench coach this year. That's step number one to hopefully having the continuity they're looking for. I just, I love the term Cardinal Z because it's so true. It's like, look, I've joked about it, but it's true. The guys they signed were 35 year old kind of boring white dudes who are married and they live close by. That's Cardinal <laughs> Z. You can, you can challenge me on that, but you know, I'm right on that. Okay. So Yadier Molina, you bring it up from a catching standpoint, but also now that he's with the uh, front office in this position, it seemed like, by the way, were you? I think you were there for this. I just found it so funny how it happened, where that one press conference was at winter meetings, and John Mozeliak was like, well, yeah, Yachty has announced, you know, via, I think it was a reporter in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah, Yachty has said he's going to be with the team. We haven't really discussed the exact role, but there will be Ian, a role. I think – Yeah, talk to him. <laughs> two days later, I think two days later, they had the press release. I just find yeah. that hilarious that Yachty still runs the Cardinals. He does. He always has, and it's beautiful. So part of that is the next question. What if things go really poorly? I don't think they will. But if things go really poorly and let's say midway through the season, Ollie's gone in this hypothetical. I mean, Yachty or Molina, you got Daniel Descalzo. Yachty is so beloved. You know when you hire a Yachty to be a manager, you're going to have to fire him down the road. Everybody gets fired. I just think, look, I root for the Cardinals to do well, but I also root for chaos and for storylines. And if Yachty were to be the manager – Oh my God, like on a daily basis, it would be just so freaking interesting. It would be chaos. Um, and if things go wrong in 2024, it almost definitely happens. If you ask my opinion, like I, the role is almost perfect too, that Yachty's in right now. Like we all know, we all could sense the the way it drug out of like, we know he's coming to the Cardinals again. What's the role going to be? The way that it ends up is like, man, an advisor and he can be here when he wants to be here. Like that's a perfect Yachty role. And that's the role that I would expect a player of his stature, a guy who's going to be in the Hall of Fame, in, in my opinion, should be in the Hall of Fame. Like, it's similar to the Holiday thing where Holiday was a star. If you want to get back into baseball, wouldn't you just want to be the guy? Otherwise, like, meh, I'll, I'll wait until somebody's ready to make me the guy. I don't want to be the bench coach for a year. Like, I don't want to be the, the grunt man for a year. Now, if you're a Daniel Descalzo, no disrespect to his career, but he wasn't a, a superstar. He wasn't that kind of name. If you're a John Jay working your way up, like you, you, you're, you know, that that's the path. If you want to continue to advance, whereas a Yachty can go, eh, I'll wait over here as an advisor. I'll come to spring training. I'll see my buddies. I'll help. Like there'll be, there will be value that Yachty brings to the table, but the freedom of schedule that he's going to have is perfect because he's already going to be domineering kind of lording over Ollie Marmel this year, regardless, he doesn't need to physically be there every day to do that. But like, if you're Ollie, he he knows what the stakes are. He knows the Cardinals need to win this year. Mo knows that. Like everybody knows, even if we really don't believe that that Mo could get relieved of his duties by Bill DeWitt, like there should be that pressure internally for everybody to say, hey, this has to be a year where it's different. But if you're Yachty, man, he's in the perfect role to if things don't go well. Well, it wasn't Yachty's fault. He wasn't really here the whole time. And yeah, he would be a great managerial candidate and he wants to be one. So he slides right in. Like I'm not predicting that happens, but What's interesting is not if they, they lose 90 games. Then it happens, in my opinion. What's interesting is if they win 83 games and don't make the playoffs. Then what happens, right? Because 
last year it was it was the roster to me. It was the way the team was built. It didn't make enough sense to get them there. The manager wasn't the guy that you can pin that on. But this year, if they're like, hey, we did the things that we meant to do, who do you blame at that point for an 83-win season? That's where it could get uncomfortable. That's a great point. I hadn't thought of that. So let's say that happens. So if they're if they end up at 83, that that means they're going to be in the playoff hunt for for really the whole season no, down to the last yeah. week or two, which means Ali doesn't get fired during the season. But at that point, 83 wins, no playoffs. I think you have to fire Ali. The Cardinals well, might be the you only. You don't renew him, right? You he's well, well his contract's okay. up. You just I'm say sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, potato, potato. You're, that you're matters gonna relieve to him. the Cardinals, right? Because it's an optics thing of, well, they don't do rash things. They don't fire guys. But he's, you know, I, to build a wit, that matters is kind of my thought process. Okay. I think this is a great point, which I hadn't thought of. Because if you win 83, though, okay, to keep him, you'd have to give him a two-year extension, which doesn't really matter because you could fire him halfway through next season anyway. But that's really interesting. If the Cardinals win 83 games – and Ollie's here, he doesn't get fired during the season, but then, yeah, you probably have to not renew him, and then you move on, and then is it Yachty or Descalzo or whoever? That's that's super interesting to me. I, had, I hadn't thought about that. I, I think that's where you could land. Like, if we're projecting mid-80s, wouldn't be crazy to think they fall a little bit short of that, and then it's like, well, how did you get to the mid-80s? Because when if you'd have said before 2023, like, hey, the Cardinals are going to win 71 games this year, you first of all, you'd have to pick yourself up off the floor, and then you would go, well, surely everybody got fired, right? But why is it that with, with the way the season actually played out, none of us were shocked not to see that level of movement? It, at least I wasn't. I didn't expect Ollie to get fired. There were days during the season where I did, and I wrote the article just in case, like because it was it got bleak at a certain point. But once it's all kind of behind you and in the rear view, we're going, yeah, I, you know, I, the Cardinals don't do stuff like that. They just they just hired this guy to that role a couple of years ago, and so they're going to let him have some room. It's really interesting to think about in that way, but if you're right in the middle where Cardinals fans have the, – they've said for years, oh, the Cardinals are just always stuck in the middle. Well, usually they're in the playoffs, which is a little bit above the middle, but if they were truly going to be that middle team to win 80, 82 games a year, that would be – that would be tricky because the front office would have to make some uncomfortable decisions. And so would ownership. I don't know what it would be, but I would lean toward like, if they miss the playoffs, I would lean toward there. There would be some change, um, especially if the fan angst got to the point that I think it would be if they miss again, because they wouldn't be able to ignore it anymore. Ticket sales were bad toward the end of last year. What's going to be interesting this year is the ticket sales thing, because a lot of those tickets were sold, assuming the team would be good. Now, at the end of the year, nobody was in the seats, but the tickets were technically still sold. When that's not the case this year, how does that have an impact? I think that is the thing that DeWitt will take notice of if they win 80 games. Yeah, and then the Ollie the discussion. So Mosaloc, in my opinion, there's no way that Bill DeWitt Jr. ever fires John Mosaloc. Whatever okay. happens, you know, and I like John Mosaloc, so I, I hope two years from now he just – goes up into that, whatever the Kenny Williams role, right? You just, whatever that role is, and somebody else can be the chief baseball officer decision maker. But Bill DeWitt Jr. will never fire John Mosaloc, in my opinion. Ollie's an interesting question. Um, and so I was going to ask you about this earlier, but then we got into kind of the baseball stuff, but you, you kind of brought it back to ticket sales. This Bally's thing, which last year we kind of wondered about, I always wondered, like, what was the real impact? Even if the financial impact wasn't felt in that year, if you think about running a business, now, not even the equity portion, you know, they own 30%. So their equity stake is essentially zero. But also, it's more about planning for cash flow. So, like the Cardinals who do everything like a hedge fund, well, they're now going to have to redo the model. It sounds like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But if you can't kind of guarantee those monies coming in in the next couple of years, or you think you might have to invest in new infrastructure if you're going to do your own TV thing or it's that's going to change, thing. Yes, that's where – because now the Cardinals are admitting it. We had John Mosellock on the radio. He said it's real. They said that to Derek Gould. I mean, it wasn't breaking news. He said that to everyone. Bill DeWitt third has said it's real. I just wonder these last couple of years how hamstrung – or how worried they are more about the future of the monies coming in 
And so maybe, I mean, look, the Sonny Gray deal, I always say this, judge not by the, the words, by the actions. There's a reason that that man's making what, 30 million, whatever it is in his third year. And they deferred all that money. Like there's a lot of uncertainty for 2024 for the Cardinals. And I think that's very obvious. And now they're admitting it. I think it impacted last year, by the way. They just didn't talk about it in the same way. Yeah, and in, in last year's winter warm-up, I thought one of the most interesting things that came from it was when Bill DeWitt III was asked about the TV stuff. And the I don't remember specifically what he said, but the answer that he gave told me, yeah, they've thought a lot about this and they're working actively on this. And I think over the last 12 months, it's probably the thing internally that they've done the most work on. And I bet when the time comes, they're going to have something to roll out that they're going to be able to feel good about. Now, whether fans feel good about it, I don't know what it's going to be because it it is a, an over-the-top subscription model, whatever. Do they have to pay more? Does it allow people to then feel comfortable dropping cable because they only have cable to watch the Cardinals anyway? Like, it's going to be interesting the way that that plays out. But I have this weird, quiet confidence that the Cardinals see what's coming and they're going to have a plan for it. But it's interesting that Sonny Gray, like you mentioned the deferrals as a reason for as a result of this situation, but I'm kind of like, well, man, that's kicking the can down the road that if the future is bleak, like what do they do with that money? Like it's probably impacting them now, but if there's not a great solution, it could impact them even further down the road. And that's why I kind of think they're confident that there will be a solution, but it could take a little bit of time to get up to it. That's kind of what, that's kind of what I'm wondering with that. Okay. So, and what I mean by that, just so you know, when you're talking about, the delivery of the television of the games. Yeah. I'm not worried about that. They'll figure that out, whether it's valleys or streaming or whatever. And I understand fans are concerned about that. And hell, I've changed my cable three times for the freaking Cardinals alone yeah. in the last five years. It pisses me off. But that's not what I was talking about. I'm talking about the impact on on revenue and payroll for the team. So am I where, though. Like okay, I, where, they gotta figure out a way think, to make it work that makes them no, money. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. And I think they will. I think they will. Yes. But my my thing is more so I think 2024 is an interesting, really weird year because it's coming off the first time in forever that they sucked. So it's the first time they're, they're probably worried and they're already seeing ticket sales for Christmas and all that. It's the first yeah. time they're really worried about that component plus the TV model, which is imploding in this year. So, you know, I'm I think the Cardinals will make money on the TV in a couple of years. They'll figure it out. Whoever's broadcasting, streaming. But I think this particular year is a really, really different one for revenue because of the, of the ticket sales based on a shitty year and the Bally's thing. And I think that's probably right. And I guess the good news would be the reports that came out about Bally's planning to pay out the full sum to all of the teams except three. And the Cardinals were one of the teams that should be good to go. So like, I think for this year it should be okay, but yeah, I mean it's going to get it's going to get really interesting if you begin a trend of where this team now that doesn't make the playoffs. And that was probably the one moment last year where in Ollie's office it was like you kind of felt the tension of the question being asked of like what's at stake for the coming year. I think Derek was the guy that asked it and it was like, "Well, what do you mean what's at stake?" And they kind of went back and forth and it like I think internally it's just known that there's a lot at stake, but that's a hard thing to say out loud. That's like you, the Cardinals are at risk of becoming that organization where you can't lean on the history anymore because it's been a while since you've even been that team that makes the playoffs every year. Like the, the reputation of the Cardinals is kind of on the line here because one year everybody like nationally, it was interesting to hear about the way people talked about last year for the Cardinals. Like, yeah, you don't see that from the Cardinals. That's crazy. This came out of nowhere. And people in St. Louis were like, well, kind of, but also not like a lot of people saw the the writings on the wall that could make this happen. And so that's the thing the the, the standard had been declining. What happens if it declines for another year? The Cardinals don't want to, you know, they don't want to reckon with that, that maybe that's just who we are right now. So that's why it's a really uncomfortable question to ask Cardinals brass. But if they don't have the season they're hoping to have, it, th there's just nothing to hide behind anymore. It's just kind of where you are and you won't be able to kind of manipulate the words or say, you know, well, we, we drew this way in attendance or we did all these things. Like eventually you just are what you are. And that's what could happen this year to the Cardinals. There will be nothing to hide behind if this is another rough year. All right, man. This was fun. I think we're good. We're past we're past 50 minutes for the first one. I think it flowed well. I think it was good. Everybody, you know, you're watching this on on my YouTube, Charlie Marlowe, 590 the fan KFNS. I'm gonna put it to start 
on the Kenny Wallace Media Podcast. Uh, so you can search that on all the podcast platforms. Of course, watch Brendan's YouTube. And tell everybody everything you got going, where to find you on all the different mediums. Yeah, I mean, my my YouTube is the the main place to go in terms of my my spoken word. Other than I, well, I do radio show in Columbia, KTGR.com. But for Cardinals specific stuff, YouTube.com slash at B Schaefer 12. Same as my Twitter handle, Brendan Schaefer, St. Louis Cardinals writer. I do daily podcasts and a lot of it's solo, kind of like you guys are used to seeing from Charlie. And I, you know, planning to do a whole lot more this year. Um, there's the B shape daily is on Spotify and Apple podcasts too, but just like Charlie, I'm trying to build up YouTube. And so we said, Hey, let's get together and, and do that. And of course, all the things I write throughout the season about the Cardinals will be KMOV, which is now first alert com. Charlie doesn't have to worry about the TV wars anymore, but that's the, the rebrand for KMOV. Yeah, I love it. And, um, we gotta, we gotta think of a name. So anybody watching, if you have a catchy name for the podcast, we don't even have to have a name, but if you have a good idea, uh, also share the show, share the channels, uh, myself, Brendan, share the, the uh, you know, subscription. Uh, if you have a group text or put on social media, we appreciate that. Comment, like, subscribe and all that. Brendan, this is fun because I do get tired of um, talking to myself. It gets so boring. this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Playing we both a little tennis. Doing the same thing. It's, you're honestly responsible for me doing it over the past year. Because last year, for whatever reason, the Cardinals let you in the press box for the the opening day game. And that's uh, it. And, and that's it. But I was sitting next to you, and you're like, yeah, this YouTube thing. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'll start it. And it's been kind of crazy over, you know, nine, ten months, the way it's been able to build up. So I see what you're doing. Uh, you inspired me to do it. And uh, now we're – I'm excited to do a weekly Cardinals chat with you. And in the comments as well, drop – future topics you guys want us to talk about because there should be plenty but if there's stuff we didn't cover we did a pretty comprehensive view of the off season but if there's stuff we didn't cover drop it in the comments and we'll try to get to it next time for sure and we'll do at least once a week hey if people are loving this we can expand it all options are on the table so i like it all right brennan thanks man good stuff once again thanks for watching you guys comment like subscribe share the show and we'll get back with you uh next week and uh have a good one, Brendan. Thanks, man. See ya. See ya.